My name is Dr. Tom Wayne, and I'm a staff cardiologist here at the section of cardiovascular imaging at the Cleveland Clinic. In today's cardiac imaging Agora session, I'm going to be talking to you about pericarditis, focusing on the latest insights in multimodality imaging and treatments. This talk is going to be divided into three sections of increasing significance and time spent, including clinical perspectives, multimodality imaging, and novel therapies. In terms of clinical perspectives, I would like to draw your attention firstly to the 2015 ESC guidelines, which remains our only guidelines for the diagnosis and management of pericardial diseases, as well as this nicely written review article published in JAC 2016 by my colleagues here at the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Paul Kremer and Arlen Klein. When we talk about pericardial diseases, there are five main clinical entities, including pericarditis, which we'll spend the most time on, pericardial effusion, constriction, and we won't spend much time on pericardial masses and congenital anomalies. Of recent clinical and research interest, however, are these other clinical entities, including recurrent pericarditis because of novel therapies, transient constriction, which may improve with adequate treatment, effusive constrictive pericarditis, as well as the mixed bag of restrictive and constrictive heart disease. Pericardial diseases often share common etiologies the most prevalent being viral or idiopathic, and other infective causes listed on the screen. In terms of non-infective causes, these include autoimmune, neoplastic, and metabolic. Increasingly recognized are iatrogenic causes, such as post-cardiac surgery or interventions, as well as post-radiotherapy. Identifying the underlying etiology may be helpful because it can guide therapy that help improve those pericardial manifestations. At the Cleveland Clinic in 2019, we saw 600 new patients, and 70% of which had idiopathic and viral etiology, followed by post-cardiac injury and autoimmune disorders. The diagnosis of pericarditis based on the ESC guidelines require two out of the four criteria of pericardiac chest pain, pericardial rub, new ECG changes, and new or worsening pericardial effusion. However, the additional supportive findings we also find are particularly helpful as they appear to be more objective, including elevated inflammatory markers such as CRP, ESR, and white cell count, as well as imaging evidence of pericardial inflammation, particularly with cardiac MRI. In terms of the disease course, acute pericarditis, and then insensitive pericarditis, which is one to three months, chronic pericarditis, which is more than three months, and recurrent pericarditis, which is two or more episodes with a four to six week period of symptom uh, free in between. What is the natural history of pericarditis? The majority of patients have one episode with resolution, 15% of whom have myocardial involvement and one to two present, present acutely with tamponade. Importantly, however, in a significant minority, 15 to 30%, they develop recurrent pericarditis of which 6% have multiple recurrences. An unknown quantity develop transient constriction, and 1% to 2% eventually have chronic constriction, which is what we're trying to prevent. Also important are prognostic factors, which may help decide which patients need hospitalization. These include fever, subacute onset, large pericardial effusion or tamponade, and lack of response to first-line anti-inflammatory therapy. Also critical are those risk factors for complicated and recurrent pericarditis, which includes incomplete response to NSAIDs, not using colchicine, using steroids, and very high inflammatory markers. We can't get away from the current era without mentioning COVID-19, which can have associated pericarditis with the presumed mechanisms of systemic and epicardial inflammation and microvascular dysfunction. In some autopsy and MRI studies, up to 20% of COVID-19 patients may have pericardial inflammation, but it's difficult to determine how many of these are actually due to COVID-19, and therefore the true prevalence is likely much lower. Also starting to be recognized are COVID-19 vaccine-related pericarditis, but at present this is extremely rare, and the benefit of vaccines still far outweighs the risk. The management of pericarditis in these patients are no different to those without COVID-19. Moving on to multimodality imaging, and I draw your attention to the multi-societal guidelines on the left from 2013, led by Alan Klein here at the Cleveland Clinic, as well as this nicely written review article published in Jack Imaging 2019 by my former fellow colleagues, Michael Chetbrut and others at here at the Cleveland Clinic. 
Echocardiography remains the first line imaging modality to assess for pericardial diseases. Notably, it can be often normal, but it can also show pericardial thickening, uh, effusions, and myocardial involvement. More valuable for echocardiography is the assessment of pericardial effusion seen on the top right, signs of pericardial tamponade listed at the bottom, and also signs of pericardial constriction. We'll spend a little bit of time on pericardial constriction, uh, which is shown on the screen. The Mayo Clinic criteria was published in 2014 and helps to distinguish constrictive from restrictive heart disease. Firstly, we expect that constriction patients to have a dilated IVC with minimal collapse, followed by respirophasic ventricular septal shift. And then higher than expected medial E prime velocity is very specific for constrictive pericarditis, as opposed to restrictive heart disease where there's a low medial E prime. Often in constrictive pericarditis, the medial E prime is higher than the lateral E prime, termed annulus reversus. And we also interrogate the hepatic veins for expiratory indiastolic reversal to forward flow velocity of more than 0.8. For restrictive heart disease, we expect signs of severe diastolic dysfunction. And echo examples on the top right include M mode showing respiratory septal shift, elevated medial E prime velocity, the hepatic vein signs of expiratory in diastolic reversal, as well as strain imaging showing that the medial septal strain to be uh, of greater magnitude than the lateral strain, which is tethered by the pericardium. This criteria was externally validated at the Cleveland Clinic in 2019. Moving on to CT, which has some roles in pericardial assessment, most obvious being assessment of pericardial calcifications, both the distribution and the extent. Also, CT is able to assess for pericardial thickening as well as effusions. CT also has a substantial sequence, the retrospective gated 4D sequence to assess for cardiac function as well as constrictive physiology. And of course, CT is valuable for preoperative planning for, uh, towards cardiac surgery. However, probably more important is cardiac MRI, which has become a cornerstone in the evaluation of pericardial diseases. In pericarditis, there's four main facets. Firstly, pericardial thickness, best seen on black blood spin echo sequences with good anatomical delineation. Secondly, pericardial edema assessment using T2 stir sequences with elevated signal. Thirdly, it can assess pericardial inflammation and fibrosis on delayed gadolinium enhancement sequences, which at the Cleveland Clinic, we use the PSIR sequence with fat saturation pulses. Finally, MRI can assess for ventricular interdependence uh, using cine imaging with and without free breathing. Uh, and also some centers use tagging sequences as well. And really there's been a paradigm shift towards using MRI, not just for grading the severity of pericarditis, but also to monitor the disease course and treatment response. Here we can see that the pericardial disease course with inflammation starts with acute, then chronic, uh, and then burnt out. Or for constrictive pericarditis, it starts from transient to subacute, chronic, and then calcific. T2 stirs elevated signal is positive initially, but then goes away relatively quickly. While pericardial delayed enhancement lingers for a longer period of time until the burnt out phase. Below are some examples of positive pericardial enhancement and T2 stir, as well as negative. On the right is an example of a patient with acute pericarditis and significant pericardial enhancement, which improved over time to resolution with adequate anti-inflammatory therapy. So sneak peek into a future uh, study that I'm going to talk about, which is RAPSD. Here's the cardiac MRI substudy um, from this uh, important trial presented by Paul Krim at ACC this year. We can see that at baseline, patients had cardiac MRI showed severe delayed enhancement of the pericardium in 44%, moderate in 20%, and mild in 28%. This degree of enhancement correlated nicely with inflammatory markers at baseline. Importantly, for patients randomized to the placebo group, a more severe baseline pericardial delayed enhancement was associated with a much higher event rate of recurrent pericarditis during follow-up. And they also had a much shorter time towards uh, first recurrence. And therefore, cardiac MRI is useful for both risk stratification for recurrent pericarditis risk, but also may guide towards treatment duration of these patients. 
Of course, uh, there are also some challenges with MRI and pericarditis, which includes the T2 stir sequence having suboptimal specificity, especially in the setting of artifact and pericardial fusion. Pericardial enhancement often graded subjectively uh, because of lack of standardization of quantitative LGE grading. An example on the right showing that it's used in the Rhapsody study. It remains controversial whether fat saturated sequence are helpful, which we believe it does. And also novel markers such as T1 and T2 mapping have limited roles and only in research at present limited by the thickness of the pericardium. MRI is also useful for assessing all the other pericardial pathologies. So the top left an example of a loculated pericardial fusion with RVOT compression. The bottom being an example of constrictive pericarditis with pericardial thickening, conical deformity of the ventricles, and respirophasic septal shift. The top right are examples of pericardial masses, the left one being an example of pericardial cyst, and the right one being a case of pericardial mesothelioma. And these masses can be distinguished using various tissue characterization sequences. And the bottom right is an example of congenital absence of the pericardium with the characteristic leftward shift of the apex. This table nicely summarizes the strengths and weaknesses of the various multimodality imaging and the assessment of pericardial diseases, which I'll leave here for you to review. Lastly, moving on to the uh, novel therapies, again, focusing starting with the ESC guidelines and then moving on to the pivotal rhylonocept and recurrent pericarditis trial called Rhapsody. And this was led by Alan Klein and Paul Kramer here at the Cleveland Clinic and published in the New England Journal of Medicine this year. But firstly, just to remind ourselves that colchicine um, has been shown in multiple randomized controlled trials to reduce the recurrent re rate of pericarditis, including when added to insects. And therefore, in the uh, current algorithm for the treatment of pericarditis, colchicine for three or six months, in addition to NSAIDs, are first-line therapy for acute or first recurrence in pericarditis. When there are multiple recurrences or colchicine resistance, then steroids are typically added for six to 12 months before weaning. And in the late constrictive phase, we might consider further third-line options as well as pericardiectomy. And here are some uh, tables for the uh, dosing and tapering regimens for these first and second line anti-inflammatory regimens. Importantly, however, a significant minority of patients uh, suffer from resistance to first line agents or become steroid dependent. And therefore there's a need to look for novel pathways to develop therapies. An important pathway of recent interest is the IL-1 pathway depicted in this figure on the left. You can see here that uh, surface antigen or danger signals binding to the cell receptors activate the inflammasome pathway, which can activate the transcriptions and cleave uh, open caspases to activate these enzymes, which will then activate IL-1 uh, alpha and beta to be released from the cell that cause systemic inflammation. And indeed, IL-1 IL therapies have now become an important new class of anti-inflammatory agents for the treatment of pericarditis. The first of these was Anakindra, studied in the AirTrip randomized clinical trial published in JAMA in 2016. In this study of 21 patients randomized to um, having continuation of Anakindra compared to placebo following a two-month run-in period, Anakindra was shown to lead to rapid and sustained resolution of symptoms and inflammatory markers in pericarditis patients. And it led to also a reduction in the rates of recurrent pericarditis with adequate safety. And therefore, it is advocated now as a useful third line agent in selected patients with recurrent pericarditis. Also, in the IREP registry that we contribute to, published a real world experience of anakindra for recurrent pericarditis in 2019, and also found much lower rates of recurrence as well as hospitalizations of pericarditis, and also more patients being able to wean of uh, steroids. Moving on to rhylonocept, which is a dimeric fusion protein made up of IL-1 receptor antagonist uh, and multiple immunoglobulin components listed on the screen. Rhylonocept acts as a decoy soluble receptor binding to IL-1 alpha or beta to present, prevent receptor binding and dampen downstream inflammatory response. Previously, rhylonocept was FDA approval for several rare uh, inflammatory conditions, 
And the dosing in adults is a 20, 320 milligram loading dose followed by 160 milligram subcutaneous weekly doses. Some adverse events are shown on the screen as well as cautions. So the phase two rhinolacept study uh, in recurrent pericarditis was published in HART earlier this year, led by, again, Alan Klein and Paul Kremer. In this multi-center open-label study of 25 patients, rhinolacept led to rapid and sustained improvement in pericardial symptoms, inflammatory markers, and quality of life, with all patients being able to discontinue or taper off steroids. So moving on to Rhapsody, which is the phase three randomized controlled trial for rhinolacept in recurrent pericarditis. This has really been a pivotal multi-centered randomized withdrawal trial for the treatment of recurrent pericarditis in patients with active pain and elevated inflammatory markers. All patients are treated with three months of Wilonsep during the run-in period, and those with clinical response defined on the screen are then randomized to continuing Wilonsep versus switching to placebo, with the primary endpoint of time to first recurrence analyzed at 12 weeks and long-term extension study ongoing at two years. In the run-in period, Wilonsep again showed rapid and sustained reduction in pain and inflammation. And in the trial period, here is the survival curve for the primary endpoint, and we can see that relonacept led to a substantial reduction in the rates of recurrent pericarditis with hazard ratio of 0.04. It also led to much improved symptoms, dampening of inflammatory markers with very good safety profile with only slightly higher rates of injection site reactions and infection compared to placebo, uh, neither, none of which were serious or fatal. And as a result of this, FDA approved uh, Rylonacep for this indication in March 2021. And really, there has been a shift in the management uh, algorithm, as seen in this uh, review article published by several imaging fellows here with Alan Klein here at the Cleveland Clinic. We can see that Rylonacep now has become an alternative or even a head of steroids in patients with multiple recurrent pericarditis. In patients with Rylonacep failure, we can consider other LL1 inhibitors such as anakindra, as well as pericardiectomy. A few words on pericardiectomy, the most common indication, of course. Apologies for that. Uh, most common indication, of course, uh, being uh, constrictive pericarditis, as well as a last-line agent or therapy for medically refractory peri uh, recurrent pericarditis. The surgical technique we advocate here at the Cleveland Clinic are median stenotomy, cardiopulmonary bypass, and radical resection, which is associated with improved outcomes. There's a lot of pericardial perioperative uh, considerations this is on the screen. In a Cleveland Clinic, a series of 601 patients undergoing pericardiectomy up to 2013, which is one of the two largest centers in the world. In hospital, mortality remains moderately high at 6%, but has improved over time. And importantly, there are marked differences in outcomes, particularly worse for those with post-radiation etiology. However, after the surviving in-hospital period, long-term prognosis is very favorable, considering that this is a very uh, adverse prognosis disease. And finally, just a shout out to the Center of Diagnosis and Treatment of Pericardial Diseases here at the Cleveland Clinic, led by multiple uh, imaging cardiologists in our section. Uh, including Dr. Alan Klein, who works closely with the surgical team, uh, as well as other specialties in a multidisciplinary fashion. With very high volumes, one of the highest in the world, we saw 2,824 patients in 2019. And there's been an increase in volume uh, over time, and we've seen the full range of pericardial disease conditions and also uh, undergo many pericardial procedures. These were figures just from 2019 alone. In summary, therefore, uh, pericardial diseases have a wide spectrum with complex pathophysiology, and the latest insights are presented today in this talk. Multimodality imaging is invaluable for diagnosis, risk stratification, treatment guidance, and surveillance of pericardial diseases. Aggressive anti-inflammatory regimens incorporating the infective and safe rhinolacept should be considered ahead of or as an alternative to steroids and recurrent pericarditis in the future. Thank you for your attention.